Good, thank you. All right, so we are going. And so I guess if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself and jump right in to whatever you okay. have. Okay, um, we still have a, well, I guess we don't have a minute. It just rolled four o'clock. So I was gonna say, I don't know if anybody else is planning on joining, but- um, Yeah, we, we can give it a minute. Uh, why don't you uh why don't you tell us what you've been working on today? How about that? Let's yeah, all there. right. Um, I am currently working on um a, a system that is a um my, the the company that I work for does a lot of inland shipping, and um I work for a manufacturing division of that company, and um my my current project is we're doing feasibility studies for a hybrid electric tugboat um and the the goal there is to um well all the things that you'd expect out of a, a hybrid to reduce fuel consumption to reduce emissions um become greener uh, reduce noise um improve reliability um all those kinds of things so um i've been um doing uh, writing simulators and and things like that to try to um, simulate the environment and and make sure that um, that when we go to actually cut steel and build a um, a new vessel around this hybrid electric technology that we have some confidence that it's going to work um, so I'm, I'm really excited about this project it's uh, it's been a super cool project so far and it uh, it I'll, I'll say also one of my themes is um, the world will try to specialize you as you go along. And um, if you love specialization, um, go down that road, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I kind of like being um, more of an inch deep, mile wide kind of person. Um, and um, so I, I like getting involved in a lot of different things. Um, this project has pulled together um, power engineering, uh, control systems, um, you know, uh, electronics, um, mechanical systems, um, dealing with um, propulsion delivered to a propeller, you know, a, a torque delivered to a propeller and what, what effect that's going to have in the water. Um, I, that's, that's right up my alley because I love getting into mechanical engineering issues and physics issues and electrical issues and um, anything from, you um, developing an algorithm that decides when we should draw from a battery and when we should start up a generator or should we, um, the battery's in a state we like and now we're gonna shut down a generator, all that kind of stuff um, is, is right up my alley and I, I really enjoy it. And um, my electrical engineering degree really prepared me for that. And, and uh, my, my specialization was, um, in, uh, was um, signals, controls and communications and, um, specifically control systems is where I focused most of my um, efforts in, in uh, electives. And, um, but, I, but I've really been, my, my degree prepared me for um, really any kind of career that I wanted. And, um, and I've been able to um, work on just, you know, a wide variety of different technologies and industries and that kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, I, I couldn't be more happy that I went down the road of, of electrical engineering and um, and you know part of one of the one of the things that I'd kind of like to let people know as they're beginning to to choose um, uh, electives and that kind of thing and choose your specialization I remember feeling like that was going to decide the rest of my career and I better get it right and the good news is it really doesn't. Um, if you, if you, um, your degree is electrical engineering. It's not going to say anywhere on your diploma um, that you got a certificate in power or electronics or any of that. Um, your degree is electrical engineering, and that's going to unlock all the doors you want it to for you. Um, so it's important, um, and and um, the the electives that you take. Um, can can have an impact, but it's definitely not um, the end of the world. So my um, my point there is kind of take a deep breath and and relax a little bit. It's okay if if um, if you pick a a discipline and then um, it, you know your career takes you in a different direction or, or that kind of thing. The really 
the important thing is you chose an electrical engineering degree and that is um, that was a, a brilliant move and and um, and it will serve you well. Um, I guess with that, um, you know, thank you for that little small introduction. So I guess for those of them that don't know you, if you'd like to just go ahead and introduce yourself, kind of where you work, you told us some of the, the things that you do on a daily basis. So, um, and then it's already about four or five. So I guess we can jump into whatever you have. Okay. Um, well, did that serve as a introduction? Was that, was that good enough? To... I, I think I think that's good. Where do you work? I think I think that'd probably be a good question. Oh, answer. I work for a company called Kirby Corporation. Um, it's a long, long time Houston um, uh, company. If you've ever driven down Kirby in uh, Midtown, um, it's named after the founder of my company. Um, and that that company has done um, a wide range of things since the twenties. My division has actually been intact since 1902. Um, so we're, uh, we're coming up on 120 years of, of, um, my, my company actually started as a blacksmith shop in downtown Houston, believe it or not. That's interesting to know. I, I did not even know that. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that's good. So if you want to just go ahead and dig in. Yeah. So the, the topic at hand here is, uh, embedded systems. So, I'm sure you, you know, if you're considering that as a as a, a career path, um, I, I'm sure you've looked into it and you and you know what embedded systems are. But I thought I would kind of talk a little bit about what it means, what an embedded system means to me, because, um, you know, I really, I think, um, I think I had already graduated by the time I really heard the term embedded systems or started really kind of thinking about what it meant. And um, it took me some time to kind of um, gel together a mean, a, a kind of a definition of what it, what an embedded system is. Um, for me, when I think of an embedded system, um, I, there's there's a, a number of different um, things that come to mind, um, but it's generally a computer that's embedded into some kind of a device, like you know a car or an ATM or a drone or or something that that does something else. It's not a computer for computer's sake. Um, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't think of a laptop as an embedded system because it's not really embedded in anything unless you, unless you embed it into something. Um, a, another um, idea of, uh, of an embedded system is um, they don't tend to have, in, in general, in my experience, they don't tend to have elaborate user interfaces. A lot of times they do their thing without a lot of user interface. And if they do have user interfaces, it's usually not a keyboard and mouse or anything like that. It's usually maybe switches that go into um, general purpose input output pins or um, you know push buttons, things like that, uh, or maybe a keypad like an ATM. Um, and and um, it, but you don't tend to see and, and sometimes you do on a on a legitimate embedded system. Sometimes you'll see a touch screen or, or that kind of thing. It's not it's not um, unheard of, but it but it's generally a system that um, has less elaborate um, user interface and and uh, display options. Also, a lot of times on an embedded system for a display, you might have a light that comes on. Um, indicating a status or, or um, something like that, or you know, blinking or sounding a horn or that kind of thing. Um, another thing about um, embedded systems is um, they're they're meant to be pretty focused um, functionally. They they don't they're they're not general purpose computers. They're not you know this isn't Excel where you can sit down and do um, a, a financial analysis one day and then do an invitation list for a birthday party the next day with the same thing. Um, embedded systems are very focused systems and they generally have a, um, a specific role um, in mind uh, when they're, and they're built from the ground up for that role. Um, they are often, by, for, because of that, they're often very streamlined and very fast and they often operating in concert with other computers and uh, and they're expected to be um, essentially real time there they, you, you never want to be waiting on an embedded uh, controller or an embedded processor um, another uh, kind of hallmark if um, 
if you're doing a birthday invitation list in Excel and your computer crashes, you, you might you might not be thrilled with it, but nobody's going to die. Um, embedded systems tend to be mission critical, um, high reliability systems, um, things like uh, medical devices or um, uh, you know, like the the controllers in your car um, for analog brake systems. If if we didn't have embedded controllers, there would be no analog brakes uh, today. Um, and in fact, a car has multiple um, dedicated embedded controllers um, that do a specific function. And uh, it, for the operator, they're so deeply embedded into the car that we don't even realize that they're back there doing their thing independently. It's a seamless um, interface for us. Um, we don't we don't even know or care how many computers there are there. There could be dozens or even hundreds. And, and uh, we don't even know when we, when we slam on the brakes, our car comes to a stop and the, and the wheels don't lock up and we're happy about it. Um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, just in terms of, of what an embedded system is, um, you know, a lot of people um, talk about is an embedded system hardware system or is it a software system? Um, and the answer, of course, is yes, it's both. Um, the, the, um, an embedded system contains both hardware and software. And um, so I would encourage um, you to be, if, if, you, if, if that is your passion and you want to go into that, um, definitely don't be afraid of one or the other. I've known a lot of people in my career that really enjoyed software, but did not want to talk about electronics or hardware or IO or any of the physical, you know, a, a sensor or four to 20 milliamps. Don't, don't bring any of that stuff to me. I just write software. If, if that's the case, stick to big systems, stick to um, uh, the, maybe more the computer engineering um, side of things. If you, if you, if you're more open to um, heck yeah, I'll do, I'll do electronics. I'll, uh, I'll get in there and, and, um, figure out how to, how to communicate with this LCD. Um, even though it's got this complicated driver that I have to work with, um, a, a lot of that in embedded systems, in my experience, um, I can remember thinking, wow, I always thought software and hardware were kind of like maybe two sides of the same coin, but but completely different topics and embedded systems, the, the division between software and hardware really gets blurred. Um, you know, if you're, if you're um, writing software for an analog to digital converter, um, it, it can sometimes get kind of confusing. Am I working on the hardware here or am I working on the software? Um, so, uh, you know, definitely learn what you can about both and, uh, and be open to both if, if that's what you know, if that's if embedded systems is something that you think you might be interested in. Um, the um, another and I, I talked about the the um, uh, kind of the, the hallmarks of the embedded systems and um, so some of the other characteristics to me. Um, a lot of times when I think of an embedded system, I'm thinking no operating system. Most of the embedded systems I've worked in. Um, there was no operating system. Um, you ju it just jumped to your first uh, code, and there's no no parallel processing. No, you just have the a, a big giant loop in the program, and and it when it gets to the end of the loop, it goes back to the beginning and starts over again, and that is your operating system. Um, that's not always the case these days. Um, there are real time operating systems that can be installed in embedded systems and, and I, I think what you'll find is um, throughout, especially throughout your careers, um, embedded systems are going to get more and more sophisticated, more and more um, powerful, and you're going to be seeing all kinds of crazy things. Um, just a, a kind of an indication of that right now. Um, there's been an explosion in the last five years on, uh, regarding the Internet of Things. And the connectivity and all that kind of stuff. That's a that's a big revolution in um, in in the the uh, functionality and the the um, importance of embedded systems. And um, I I, um, I worked on a, a system a few years ago that um, sat on a pipeline and it had some sensors and um, 
we, we came up with a, an algorithm to watch the pressure in a pipeline with a pressure transducer. And by watching for a, a certain characteristic um, surge and, and dip in pressure, we could detect a leak. And not only could we detect the leak, but since we had multiple um, sensors up and down the pipeline, we could actually determine the location of the leak by the timing. All that took place with GPS. Uh, we, we got um, exact time synchronization through GPS. Um, we got the locations of the sensors through GPS. Um, we were communicating data um, back up to a satellite feed um, or cellular feed or Wi-Fi, whatever you have. We had to support multiple um, protocols, but, um, but the point is, um, these weren't just, you know, in, in the past, this would have been done with a strip charter, which actually wouldn't have been feasible in the past. But if you did have some kind of remote monitoring station like that, it would have had a, a circular strip chart recorder and a human being would have had to get in a pickup truck and drive out to it and grab it. And that's just not the case anymore. The, the Internet of Things and all the hardware development and software development that's gone into that has interconnected embedded systems to the point where um, we now talk about front end and back end development for embedded systems. Um, and and uh, this particular system loaded data into an Azure database. And um, we, we had uh, software engineers writing um, uh, back end software that would um, do other kinds of analysis and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Very, very cool system that. Um, really was not, you know, at the beginning of my career would certainly not have been feasible. Um, the, the, the hardware and the software and the technology and everything just wasn't available to do that kind of thing. So, um, so that's a, a, a kind of a real world example of an, of an embedded system. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, throughout your career, you, 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 as Doug had talked about, you really need to be open to um, changing and learning. And, and um, one other way to highlight that, I'll show you. I'm hoping everybody can see their screen. Can you see this device? Yes, the very small and complicated one. <laughs> yes, it's very small and very complicated, or at least it was for me. Um, this is a, um, an embedded controller that um, I worked on probably five years out of school. And um, I actually designed all the hardware in this, um, and it um, it has this was um, went into a panel, and uh, sorry, I'm blanking out there on you. Um, this went into a panel, and um, it does have an LCD, um, so that it could display values, and it had um, tons of I/O. It had analog input, so you could put in there a voltage signal or a, a current loop. Um, that kind of thing. It had digital inputs, so like it could read switches or, um, you know, a pressure switch or something like that. It had outputs, um, different kinds of analog outputs, so it could drive a motor or um, open and close um, valves, uh, you know, relay drivers, so it could turn on lights and, and that kind of thing. And um, the this. Um, this device is powered by a 186 processor. It's actually a 188 processor, which is the microcontroller version of the 186. And um, if you've never heard of a 186 processor, um, if you ever, like if your grandparents have an old computer that's maybe a Pentium, that was a 586. Um, if they've got a really old computer laying around, maybe it's a 386. This is a 186. Um, it's, a, it's a chip that was developed by Intel um, probably in the 60s, I would guess, um, but it was still around um, in embedded systems in a, in a perfectly um, adaptable and powerful um, chip. And uh, it did everything we needed. Um, and and th that system is really where I kind of cut my teeth and learned uh, my way around um, embedded systems. Um, and, and again, I primarily did the hardware on that system, but I did write a lot of software and I wrote some of the device drivers and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, again, um, I, I have never really drawn lines and said, you know, this is my world and that's not my world. Um, I, I, I love rolling up my sleeves and learning something new and, and um, digging in and getting into it. Um, so, um, you know, 
in terms of, um, and I, I'm, I'm rapidly running out of time here, but. Um, uh, you the, have time, you have time, don't worry. <laughs> okay, well, um, so, um, and, and um, in, in terms of um, working in a, um, an embedded environment, um, I, I can't stress enough the importance of quality work and, and um, embedded systems, um, clever is a bad word. Um, we, we would rather see something reliable um, that's, that's bulletproof. On this particular device, there are still, um, this, this, I completed this in probably uh, sometime in the 90s, I don't remember. Um, but um, it's, yeah, there are some of those devices that have been in the field for 25 years and they're still running today just like they did 25 years ago. Um, and they don't get frequent software updates that not, you don't do anything to them. In fact, you can update the software, but um, that piece of electronics actually gets encapsulated in epoxy. Um, so it's completely filled in a chamber with epoxy. Um, and so there, it's a brick and, um, and the software has to be the same mentality. Um, so we, we really stress um, bulletproof, reliable, thoroughly tested software. Um, you know, uh, like when was the last time you had to reboot your microwave? Um, well, maybe you did and you didn't know it. Maybe it quit working and you <laughs> unplugged it and plugged it back in and it started working and, and that was the real issue. But, um, but you just don't expect to have to um, reboot your microwave. It just does this thing. Um, and that's kind of the mentality that you, um, that you need to go into with embedded systems versus other software products are more tolerant. Like I mentioned, if Excel crashes, well, it might not make for the best day, but it's, it's generally not um, life-threatening or, or that kind of thing, whereas embedded systems tend to be. So um, it's a it's a little bit of a, a different mindset, a little bit of a different mentality. And, and I encourage you to um, take that really, really seriously when you go into it in terms of testing. Uh, testing in embedded systems can be uh, quite challenging. Um, I'm sorry. Um, my uh, computer, my phone is silent, but my computer decided to make noise. Um, in terms of testing, it can be pretty challenging because um, you um, you don't necessarily have access. There's remote debuggers and that kind of thing, but it's often um, debuggers change the timing of things. So if you have complicated sequences of, of um, interrupts and things like that that are happening, it can be very challenging. Um, so you, um, you, uh, you really have to be um, adaptable and um, thorough and detail oriented to work in a in a uh, embedded world, and um, and that's not untrue for software in general, but it's it's really really magnified in embedded systems. Um, and um, some of the some of the things that can happen, especially in a operating op, in a system with no operating system. Um, it's really easy to do things like create endless loops um, where, it, where it can never get out of a loop under a certain condition. Uh, memory leaks are pretty easy. Um, and that's why I say um, in embedded systems, we tend to shy away from fancy, elegant programming and stick to rock solid basics um, because, um, you know, uh, um, when, you, when you get clever and when you get fancy and you um, do things like uh, on-the-fly memory allocation. It's it's pretty easy to uh, make very very subtle mistakes that can you know fail to deallocate memory, and before you know it, um, the system is crashing because it's it's run out of memory. We call that a memory leak. Um, I think that's um, pretty much the flavor of what I wanted to talk about. Um, I know there weren't a whole lot of questions before, but um, but if there are any, I'd love to love to talk more about it. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, shoot. That's what we're here for, after all. I think um, so far, I want to um, before we get any questions, thank you, David, for coming out and speaking. Yeah, absolutely, my pleasure. And if you're shy, you can always type a question in the chat.
if you're shy or if you don't have a microphone. Okay, well, I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk about it and I and, uh, hope everybody's um, having a great semester and, and um, you know, uh, getting closer to, to picking your um, concentrations. Yeah, indeed. So this is a uh, last day. So. Oh yeah. Student advisory week. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, here's here's the oh, there we go. What kind of courses would you recommend us to take? That's a. Yeah. Um, that that is a an excellent question, and um, and I would definitely rely on your advisor, which I didn't. Um, Our the uh, advisor for that concentration will actually be here next to talk about that. Yeah, so so definitely ask that question on the next um, presentation. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, you want to be um, taking um, programming courses and electronics courses, um, digital electronics, um, especially. But you know, like my experience is, um, if I had been, if I hadn't been comfortable with um, uh, sensors, um, things like um, thermocouples or pressure transducers with four to 20 milliamp amplifiers built into them. Um, you know, um, things like uh, different kinds of signals, pulse width modulation, um, all those kinds of things. Um, I was never developing a system for the sake of developing that system. I was always trying to accomplish something. And so the better you understand the world around um, the, the embedded system, um, the better off you'll be. So, um, you know, I, I would say for um, what, what I would look for in a, in a recent graduate um, would be a strong um, electronics uh, elective suite and a, and a strong um, uh, proficiency in uh, programming. And, uh, and, and probably, you know, maybe um, specifically, there's a great, I think it's actually a 5,000 level class, but or that is actually two, but but um, uh, your advisor who's about to be on can uh, can actually answer that question. But there's actually some classes that are in, entitled embedded systems that are required um, courses for that, and um, those are just outstanding courses just from looking at the at the um, syllabus for them. So here, I guess I have a question while we're waiting for other questions. Is um, so I've had different um, experiences with PLC. Is PLC something that's really more on the embedded side or is that is that a different area? A, a PLC is not typically considered an embedded system um, and um, although it has some similarities and, and maybe maybe it properly is considered an embedded system um, and um, PLCs have typically a very special programming environment and, mm -hmm. uh, and and they're ultra. They're intended to be ultra reliable, um, and and the way the um, the way the logic is laid out for a PLC, um, you you uh, you eliminate a lot of potential programming mistakes, um, and and a lot of um, PLCs have um, FPGAs built in, so you can actually do um, really fast, complicated high reliable programming in them. But generally a PLC is um, traditionally, it's something that's sitting in a rack in a control room mm -hmm. in a chemical plant. It's not really kind of quite the same thing, but it does have a lot of similarities. Yeah, that's why I asked, because I wasn't sure, because I've, I've worked with, I guess, different aspects of both um, PLCs and, and other types of computers. And that was a question I never, I didn't know if it was considered as that. On, on average, so that's that's nice to know. So really nice to know. Mm, that's a good question in the chat. That's a good one. Um, for me, uh, I I I'm I'm old, so don't pay too much attention to this. Um, I've mostly worked in C, and um, and. And I've steered most of my uh, opportunities into C. I don't even know if you guys learn C anymore. 
Um, we do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it's it's still um, it's still pretty prominent. Um, you see things like Java, um, and and a lot of your, um, you know, um, the um, Arduino and and those kind of things. That that is the basis for embedded systems. Um, so whatever languages are available on on uh, Raspberry Pis or Arduinos or all that kind of stuff, that that is um, exactly what you'd be encountering. Um, there are some also uh, specialty languages like LabVIEW um, from National Instruments. Um, you can do um, you can target embedded systems um, through LabVIEW and 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 they and even with LabVIEW hardware, they have FPGAs and that kind of thing. Um, but in general, it's going to be the 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 Java and that kind of um, that kind of stuff. All right. Well, if um, if there's no other questions, I'm actually going to run to a 4:30 meeting. If if that's all right, Colin. I think that's perfectly fine. We're still waiting on another presenter, but um, I guess the students can just sit tight for a minute. That's it's all good. So um, thank you, David, for coming out. Um, we appreciate yeah, absolutely. it. absolutely. My pleasure. Um, you know, as Doug was saying earlier, if you guys want to reach out, um, there's an IEB website. David is actually a really great guy. I work with him all the time. Um, David, how can they reach you if they want to reach you? Um, there's contact information um, in, uh, let me just type in, um, I'll give you my, um, I'll give you my work email address. And um, yeah, no, no, um, no harm. Feel free to reach out anytime there. And uh, my, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Dang it. I missed a period. <laughs> that happens to the best of us. I don't know if there's a way to delete that or not. Um, it's the second uh -huh. one. With the yeah. It's the um, one that's su that's sooner. <laughs> the most recent. Yes, um, the most recent. So yeah, reach out anytime. Uh, um, I've had uh, lots of students reach out, and and um, you know I always enjoy uh, interacting. So if anything comes up, don't don't hesitate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're you might you're definitely going to hear from me. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to it. All right. Well, thank you very much, um, David, for coming out. Um, yeah. And we really appreciate the insight you've given us. Yeah, my pleasure. Talk to you soon, Colin. Yep. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. All right. So, all right, guys. So pretty much what's going on now is um, Dr. Chin, who is the computer and embedded concentration advisor, is going to come speak on the concentration. And she's probably going to give you guys a pretty good rundown. Um, we're waiting on her now. Um, originally, she was supposed to come um, about 4:40, so we're trying to get a hold of her just because you know little disparity there as far as the time is concerned. So um, just to kind of give you guys a rundown of what she'll talk about, and she will probably talk about. She has like a little presentation where she'll come and say, "What is the computer um, for?" Computer embedded concentration, what's kind of maybe the differences between that and computer engineering, which some of um, our other students have taken, as well as some of the classes. And she will probably go into de more detail there. So um, stay tuned. We're trying to get a hold of her. So <laughs> y'all probably won't have to wait too long. If y'all have any questions as far as any of the, any of the concentrations go, um, feel free to reach out to me um, or any of or if you want any contact information for anybody that you've seen so far, um, where will they be posted? So right now, um, I, I'll send you guys the link real quick. We have an IEEE UH um, YouTube channel. 
And although, yes, they will not be the best quality, I will say that if y'all been paying attention, um, I will post the link real quick. Uh, but they will be at our IEEE UH uh, YouTube channel. So give me a second and I'll get that posted. I do believe that none of them are posted yet, just, um, just because of the delay. Um, internet, that's literally all it's coming down to is just video editing and um, internet, although there's not a whole lot of editing and a whole lot of internet. So yeah, so we'll get those posted. Um, and with that note, if you have any questions regarding any of the concentrations, um, or I guess the YouTube channel, um, or really anything, I mean, uh, feel free to ask. So there is the YouTube channel. I posted it in the chat. So there's that. We have other videos there, but we don't have those yet. So um, we should be getting those at the latest. They should be started uploading this weekend, hopefully sooner. So I'm going to go radio silent for a minute, and I uh, will see you all soon. Good evening, Dr. Chen. It's good to see you. Hi. Yeah, I just saw the email. I didn't check email earlier, so it just got in. You probably sent me email a few minutes ago. I didn't see it. It's all good. All good. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, and we just had one of our in working engineers off the IB come and do a little presentation about his work. And I think we're looking forward to hearing about what you have for us and hearing about some of these classes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Let me check my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Sure can. Okay. Computers and embedded systems. Yeah, so today is the right session. I'm sorry. Some people yeah. couldn't <laughs> <do> my... <laughs> It's all the good. It's all good. Yeah, it's a good. Uh, we we never get lack of uh, motivation. So hi everyone, everybody. Um, Dr. Yu Chen. I'm, I think in charge both of uh, the EC the EC E E side of the computer embedded systems as well as the computer engineering major CP program. So all these degree plan uh, degree plan forms will come to me. I will sign those off, and uh, depending on courses you could take. Especially if you actually at the consultation stage at this stage, if we agree upon say especially my course, I will send you additional information so you'll be putting on the priority list. So just uh, make sure that 
if possible, you stay to the end because that's part I'm talking about course selections. If you have to leave early, you can follow up uh, with me after this and just send me any uh, email and I'll follow up and just let you know what we covered in the last part. Okay, so I'm the only white chain in the department. But don't just look at Dr. Chen and then send email everywhere because you will hit I now I lost track. Maybe only one out of six chance you're gonna hit me. <laughs> All right, but fortunately I'm the only white chain here. The rest mostly called J chain. So just for whatever reasons. That's just the fun part. And uh, congratulations that you actually get interested into computer and embedded system. I think that's the most exciting field. Of, of course, they are comparable to the computer engineering program I taught uh early on Monday. So these two are hard to pick and I'll talk about a little bit cues. If you cannot decide uh, out a little bit about what I see those two majors. All right, so this is the really exciting field. Anywhere between the Mars, now is really you fly helicopters on Mars and everything from there to robot. Actually, some of our grads were designing the actually the, the space suit for NASA. So that's very, very exciting. And if you look at cars, each car has hundreds of processors inside and now running all high-tech AIs in there. And uh, we have lots of oil gas companies in the local area. What they did is if you can see the little figure right here, what they did is in nanotube, like a narrow tube, they actually put all the circuits and the processor and sensors in there. They're gonna go down and uh, try to detect the layers of rocks and what kind of composition and try to make determination if there's oil down there or not. So that also uh, have electrical engineering as a critical part because sensors data will not be processed without our contribution. And these actually carry a really huge responsibility. That's the thing actually I want to also talk about is that for oil gas operations, can you believe that if you just put things down to downhole and get up, it takes about a day to complete that process. So that one day operation costs millions of dollars at one site. So that means our design has to be highly reliable. So if, again, these are really in the most out the side of the globe, right? So if you send your circuit board over there, they assemble into the tool chains and going down up. And unfortunately, your process is not running properly, you didn't get the signal detected, they didn't get stored properly. Once they get to the surface, you have nothing. Literally, just in that one day, you have wasted millions of dollars. Not to say that the pause they have to do to wait for the bug to be fixed and so on. So one thing I want to say that to be in embedded, you have to carry really high responsibility because right now, most of things are either going to medical um, equipment, it goes to the cars, it goes to the moving parts of robots and everything. And uh, we try to minimize the bugs that actually in the system, literally try to eliminate that. So it really requires you to be dedicated. It has to be patient as well. Of course, lots of uh, testing skills, but the responsibility is number one. And of course, uh, personal integrity is equally important because we really cannot uh, cut corners it, well, your code is sitting in the cars, even in the microwave. I also also one my, my microwave oven was supposed to be new and from a very reputable brand. And almost caused fire because the timer there, once I set 20 seconds, it goes down. And then who watches the, the, the running of the microwave oven, right? So of course, when you hit, you do something else. The minute I turn back, it became like 20 minutes on a timer <laughs> but it give me a shock because definitely if i don't watch it and uh, it will cause fire and the next few weeks i observe say five to seven different uh, occurrence every time it's in a different situation so basically you cannot repeat the the, the bug that you saw but over a, a period of uh, say one week it appears again so eventually we call this uh the the uh Taking support from it was a Whirlpool, we're really the top brand. Right? You can't believe that this happening with Whirlpool. So they came back with a new controller board, which is literally the investment board. They said there was a bug in there, whatever. And they replaced it, and the incident get much reduced. 
but over the past year, I still observed four times in random places, but I cannot repeat it. So I just came away that I just see I have to watch it. So that you can see that as simple as a timer in a micro oven could literally get fired from 20 seconds to 20 minutes if you're not watching there. It's random. It's not like become 20 seconds to 20 minutes. Then I actually punch two more zeros because it goes down to 16 or before I actually not watching it. And suddenly it's like 23 minutes or something, some random numbers there. So if you actually take my course, you know that even make a simple timer in my FPG chip requires lots of effort. And I was surprised that they let those bugs scrape into the actual mature product. So this is actually one of the important slides because you have to decide if, if it's your lifestyle or, or if it's your personality. Sometimes uh, I recommend students not to take those majors if they uh, cannot really get to the, those level details. In, on one level, of course, you can train students. The second level, if your thinking is not detailed enough, especially your coding style is really uh, kind of a rusty uh, in terms of, for example, one of my first hire of my PhD student came to me and the first time, and it was shiny on the resume, but then he came to me saying, Dr. Chen, I can, if the code is less than 50 lines, I can write it. So I used to know I hired the wrong person because eventually he transferred uh, to a different program but those are the wrong decisions that those students make because if you want to stick with computer embedded, people assume that you naturally will be able to program. You always get better, but if you think that's a big obstacle and in your junior, senior year, I don't think it's time to fix those. You better find a kind of division of electrical engineering that fits your ability. There's tons of different areas that don't require extensive coding and you will do really fine. And the student actually came to me, I think he would do great if it's more like MATLAB type of coding, as opposed to give you an embedded system, you have to take care of every single detail. So those are things I want to evaluate yourself, be honest. And I want you to play your strength as opposed to weakness. Although of course everything can change if you, maybe one course can alter your interest a lot, but if coding is always unnatural to you, I honestly, I'll recommend you to pick a different concentration area. So that's the first thing I want to talk about. Okay, so assume that you pass that test. The second one is where the jobs are. So jobs I could say, depend of course, uh, the uh, economic uh, situation, economic situations, but even in pandemic, my students got hired everywhere. So just more recently, my PhD student got the offer from Intel in San Jose. And the last year, just during the pandemic, my student got a full-time FPJ and embedded system design jobs just locally here. And they did a Zoom interview and they just hired him literally on the spot. So jobs are everywhere as long as you really know the in and out, especially integrate to uh, your earlier years experience. So people think, okay, I want to be specialized in, in embedded or computer. I can forget about everything I learned in electrical sounds like waste. No, it's not. All the basic circuits and the, even the high pass, low pass filters, analog circuits, those actually sometimes become a roadblock before you actually uh, get a job because interview will start with all those down to the earth practical problem before they actually hit the problem set based on your core strength. If you can't answer those practical problems, how do you deal with noise? How do you get the signal securely into your processor or FPJ before you can process it? You probably don't get interviewed in the second round, which is your core strength. So I really want to say that try to review your early years. Don't think that's a waste of time, they're not. And in, down the road, although you can concentrate on programming side of the, the system, you encounter all those electrical uh, problems because you're working in practical uh, scenarios. In terms of jobs, I'll, I don't want to say where they're highly embedded. I will say almost everywhere. Say HP is hiring our students. Okay, they're doing some really fancy server type of computer architecture type. They hire people who are. Uh, kind of trained in embedded system architecture and of course by FPGA designs. 
and I had tons of local NASA contractors. And one of my former students just took a course undergrads and went to a NASA contractor. He did so well. And he eventually decided to join NASA's main quarter, the headquarter. So they also had openings at the reputation of our students. They just keep trying to, to get our students because they, they get really proper training. And there's tons of oil gas companies like Halliburton, Schlumberger, and others. And of course, oil gas is a little bit cyclical. So depending on the year you graduate, you may or may not have those jobs, but they always have internships. So if you have a chance, they actually come to our campus every year to hire those internship students. And so if you're considering, I think this round is probably already past kind of really late, but if you're actually rising junior, try to watch next year, because every spring, early spring, I think, they, the, in the career fair, all those companies come into our campus to look for internship students. So I would say that uh, everything is uh, available is and, uh, on the table. And also, like my students are joining Google, I want my PhD student getting to Apple and being an architect of their new chip. And I have another of my PhD student got into Google, and my course student, two of my course students got Google. They're working at Google now. And then I have Intel, many students in Intel and so on, so on. But my recommendation is that since the embed is more towards maybe controlling robots and stuff, take at least one control course in your undergraduate study because coding is easy to pick up after you graduate because we keep kind of updating our coding skills, but not control. This is one of the hardest one and actually E grads has better position, is better positioned uh, then CS because that's a core course in E curriculum. I know it's an elective in your curriculum, but I highly recommend that you take one control course, the basic ones. Then once you know the basic, it's easier for you to build on top of that for all the advanced ones. But just do take one. All right. Any questions here? Or you can ask a question at, at the end. So in terms of courses, and uh, you can see that we have. Uh, a bunch of really core electives. You, you see lots of uh, core. The first page on your degree plan, there are two courses you can select from, which is the 4437 and uh, 5440. It says either or. And you can see when I get to the form, I want you to definitely circle 4437 because that's the first embedded course above micro P, right? And if you want to graduate with embedded concentration, it doesn't make sense not to even take any advanced courses beyond micro P because everybody's taking micro P for all the students. So that, so in case you like both courses, I'll talk more. And my course, which is 5040 has to be on the elective side on the second page. And then the middle one is also a key course for this concentration. And uh, for the previous round, even if you actually downloaded the degree plan a few days ago, actually this one was accidentally dropped. So Amanda just put a new form there. So if you hear this, they want to send me for signature, make sure you re-download from the website because they accidentally dropped this after uh, they tried to revise the form. Easy for students to fill up. And in terms of prerequisites, as you can see, there's a kind of dotted line here, but that's for uh, historical reasons. Uh, older days, I, I don't know, a few years ago, microprocessor was named 4436. In that case, always kind of a conflict with which one takes first or which one second. So they just did a co-requisite. That means both courses can be taken in the same semester. But then they actually bumped that down to 3436. There's not much uh, in terms of conflict, but really it's really highly recommend that you actually take that course before you hit into my course. Again, you can see that that will become a roadblock for the rest of the courses if you don't take that early. So make sure that you take care of the middle micro P course early in your journey. So I don't know, some are like rising junior, just try to take that the first chance you have it. It's taught in both semesters and get that off uh, the, the, the roadblocker because the 4436 is only taught in the fall. So if you don't, design properly your curriculum, you may actually, it will become a, the roadblock for your later courses. Again, the rest of them, you should take them as soon as possible as well. Hey, Dr. Okay, so, Chen, it seems yeah. there's some questions in the chat for you. Oh, I can't, you, 
for some reason, uh, I think the drawback for the Zoom, once you present, you can't see the chat at all. So you have to read that off to me. So that yeah, chat sure button just disappeared for the presenter. I don't know if you notice or not. Oh, yeah, you have to, um, you have to where it says at the top, the green thing, where view options, if you go and put your um, mouse up there, it'll drop down. Yeah, it dropped to... down, but the, the chat is missing. Oh, yeah, yeah that's uh, actually there's three I, dots. Uh, here. Yes, the you, three you dots. See there's three dots, I believe, and then you click on that and it drops down more options. Oh, yeah, chat. yeah, okay, now I see it. All right, yeah. let me see. Count towards control course. Which course will be counted as control type of courses? Okay, I'll talk about that when I get to the last page when you see the degree plan. Okay. I think two were uh, control questions. And again, I think that will take care of uh, when we get to there. And the other is where can we find a revised form again? I don't know where you get it for the first place, but Ms. Amanda say she updated the website. So in case you can find email her, I don't know the link. What is TOT? I'll, I'll go find it real quick. Okay, yeah. IOT, yeah. IOT means Internet of Things. That's a, okay, yeah. So now, since I'm on this page, it's the best place to talk about this. Older days, even now, if you look at catalog 5440, uh, 5436 was named Advanced Micro P. But since Micro P has this scary notion, I know if, it may not be true for all students, but that was the, the first scary thing that you first time you look at assembly things, and people have less motivation to take Advanced Micro P. But in fact, uh, the course covers the most up-to-date cutting-edge technologies required by industry, especially for the embedded system students. Okay, the course would cover R uh, RTOS, which is real-time operating system. That's a critical uh, component to ensure the critical sensor data will get to executed and taken care of before the low priority ones. So industry really, really care if the students get trained for real-time OS or not. At least they all have the same concept, may not have the same RTOS OS, but you're going to use one of those and then understand how you set the priorities for different sensor data, and this is a critical need for industry. The second concept is IoT, that means Internet of Things. That means everything's connected, not only your cell phones. So all the, for example, the microwave ovens, the newer ones, refrigerator, they are connected to internet, and the small sensors are connected to internet. So the, in, the notion of internet of things is really a big hit to the industry. They want everything to be connected so they can collect more data and understand more user uh, behaviors. And also this allows them to have real-time access to all the sensor data. So even during the hurricane seasons, you can actually see on a website the, the water level for the bio, right, at different locations. Why? Because they're connected. They have sensors there, but no, it's not a person to go there collect data, right? And in that case, it will not be real time. So all these things have the internet component building, and it's really important to understand that. So I really highly recommend all the embedded students to take this course, if possible at all, because the, the, the top two will really strengthen your so-called embedded systems concentration. And these two courses are taught by really uh, really experienced engineer, uh, Dr. Harry Lay, and uh, he was, HP earlier was compact engineer for over 30 years. And then more recently he got retired over from HP and he asked if they, he can teach. Then He's here and he's with us every day. I'm so excited because he knows everything, literally everything. So you just ask him questions, whatever, the final project, senior project, he will just talk. So it's really great opportunity for you to learn more uh, about this, especially with his over 30 years experience at HP. He literally touched every single component from ASIC FPG designs to embedded system design architecture, different bus standards, you name it. He has it, okay? And last class is mine, and it's called Advanced Digital Design. And this is a, a big deviation from all your embedded system concept, which means that this is not a C or C++ based uh, course. In this course, the students can learn a new language called Verilog 
HDL, which is hardware description language. It's a language, software language created just for designing hardware. And students can buy those FPJ boards. And those are, I don't know if you can show here nicely. So those little boards, instead of having a processor on, on, on board, it has a, a device called FPJ. Okay, good or bad about this? The good thing is that it's really fancy. You can do whatever you want. But unless you know what you want to do, you can plug in power, it will do absolutely nothing. Okay, because I don't know how many have been uh, working with uh, Arduino or Raspberry Pi. Like for Raspberry Pi, you literally plug in, you plug in your HD monitor, you plug in keyboard, you boom, you get the graphic interface running, you get your keyboard running, right? It sounds like so easy. But FPGA, you see this little big button here? Once you push this, yes, it will have one light on, that's it. The rest of signals are sitting there idle unless you write a circuit behind it to take the signal and do whatever you want. So basically, to get trained on this, you have to be really thoughtful. That means you really need to know by heart what you are supposed to do before you can teach this FPJ to do anything. Okay, this in contrast for the embedded, so-called traditional embedded concepts. I don't know if you have the experience there are so many designs because now like you have Python packages, this package and that package. You can do a fancy project by downloading a bunch of packages and write a few lines. Boom, it works. And it's so exciting, it's, it's so fancy. But when people interview, you say, why it works that way? You probably can only answer maybe 25% of the questions because someone else helped to develop the code in the packages. That's where the heavy lifting is. That's where the, the, the essence about theory, about the uh, actual coding is behind. And you just call some of the APIs for the function and you really don't know how it really works as a whole, but you are able to call a small portion of that, make that work for your application, which is still great. But for APJ, you, if you cannot think right, your APJ is not gonna be acting right. All right, but it's really challenging to get to that point. I'll talk a little bit more. Uh, let me check again for any new chats because it disappears by itself. Okay, I only have, oh yeah, yeah. Just uh, for those people listening, I think uh, there's a link to the, the form, right? All right, so let me move on. I need to monitor my time. Okay, so I only have two more pages here. And this is the new one. I just updated this uh, 10 minutes before the talk with the new link that uh, I actually, I'm gonna send me direct the PDF file. That's why I don't have the web link. And on the first page, you see the big red circle, right? So that's what I'm talking about. I think for historical reasons, they want either 4437 or my course 5440 as the core elective. But as you can see, I explained, in order to graduate with that concentration, you better have an embedded course on your top of your list. So make sure that you only circle the top before you send me for signature. And also make a note that 4437 is a four only class. Okay, so if you mess up your schedule, you may have to delay for one year. So that's pretty much on first page. Otherwise, the first page is not much to discuss. You just need to follow all these requirements. Okay, on the second page, uh, for embedded, you have so many choices, <laughs> and you are only allowed to choose three. And usually there are more than you want. So I'll say if you like more than three courses, there are a couple of places you can actually add. Okay, so in the middle part, can you see my cursor right here on your screen? If I move my cursor, can you see? I believe I saw it a second ago, but I lost. Oh, yep, there, I see it. Okay, I can't move too fast. I think that's what it is. All right, so in the middle part, you see this EC electives, right? So if you have lots of good choices on the right column, uh, you can actually put those in here. And the other thing I want to recommend is that although the list that you choose from, starting with level three or three, uh, uh, starting with the three, and then there are four level courses and five level courses. Since you're gonna actually take those in your junior high uh, or senior year, unless you are rising junior in your first semester, otherwise I really don't recommend you take a three level courses like the top three in your 
junior, especially senior year, because when they look at transcript, they think you're going backwards. Okay. And again, we have plenty of uh, new courses uh, that's available. But if you want to take those courses, try to squeeze those into early years. So either maybe your last semester in your sophomore year or the rising junior, the first semester. But otherwise, try to stick with the four level or five level courses. And there's another chance you can actually squeeze in some good courses, which is a technical elective. So for the technical elective, there are a few other departments courses. If you already take that, that's great. Just circle that so you don't get the chance, of course, to take another EC elective. But in case you are not very interested in the math department classes or physics, then you can choose another almost free ECE course to be putting in here. The reason I'm talking about this is so many, there are so many good courses, and even just on the right side column. And again, I bet there are many more in other choices to broaden your view. And I just want to maybe talk about a few, but before I do that, make sure that you know how to fill up the last part, which is easy elective labs. You don't have, this includes all labs you've taken. So for example, the DLD, uh, will be having a four on the second digit of the course number, right? So if you see a four in the second digit of your course number, there's one credit associated with that as a lab. So for example, the requirement is 4437, right? So the second four means there's one hour lab credit. And you can just write down, say the first one is 4437. And again, if you like the advanced micro P or art house, you have 5436. So the second digit is again a four. That means that's a lab course. So you can write in this elective labs as 5436. You are done with two. They're so easy to have another one somewhere. I think the logic design will also come towards that. If not, uh, you have plenty of choices here. Like for example, the internet working has a four credit course. So internet working right here is 54, 51. So the second digit again is a four. I mean, three hours of lecture and plus one hour lab. So just pick the one that you plan to take right here in the EC lab part. Okay, write the entire course number there. And if you want to make sure, you don't forget also write the course title there. So it will be also to yourself. Okay, it's so the last part. I really have to control the time. The last part is which elect is best for embedded. Okay, there are so many good courses. For example, again, if you pick the course in the first page, don't pick that on the second page. So 4437, that's already picked on the first page, so don't double count it, don't pick that. And the, the, this one is an automatic control system. I think that's option when I talk about take some control courses, that's one option. And I believe that the professor also has a little bit upper level courses, but just stick with the lower level ones. Any country course you take at undergrad is good. Okay. And then again, I said the top three probably might not my top choices, but make sure that you take one control course before you leave. And the next option is, of course, my course. And my course is really challenging, as you, I mentioned, everything you have to really understand, every single detail. Okay, to implement one module, and all the modules have to work together. And it's a tremendous amount of time commitment required beyond the three hour lectures. And because you can put a, a quote on a limit on debugging time, so I was a lot. You have to be coming from your heart, you really want it. Okay, basically, we have four labs, each lab has two weeks, and they're major labs. And you cannot skip labs. Uh, the first lab is used for the second lab. The second lab is used for third lab and fourth lab. So basically, uh, on my description, I'll say the labs are only graded if they are working on the IPJ board. So this requires extensive commitment outside the class time. And it's in spring only and it's permission only. And they are still in doubt in terms of expected uh, course efforts. You can email me. I want to make sure that if you, you, you're coming to class, you will be thriving, not because it's kind of bipolar. I want everyone who actually decided to take my courses to go out with an A. So to me, there's no B student, not to say C or D students or F. 
So basically, I want people to really benefit. The only way you can benefit is to be able to fill all that requirements and achieve A in the class. So there's nothing in the middle. There's no mediocre designers where you can design the chip because every single round is $1 million in the industry. Okay, and so for this, uh, if you really decide this is a, a right course for you, you're gonna send me the degree plan. I'm gonna confirm with you. Are you happy with the course load? If you're saying yes or agree upon that you're fit for this class, I'll send you a permission, not, not a permission form now, but information uh, form for whoever I signed off on degree plan. So you will be put on the priority list because there will be a wait list on my course. Usually I take anywhere between 50% to 70% depending on the year. And if we agree upon with this, maybe one round, two rounds of consultation, you think that's the best fit, you'll be putting on the priority list. Okay, so that's my course. And uh, then there are a bunch of internet working. Again, this one comes with one lab course. So if you're lacking a lab course, that's probably the only bet other than the three I talked about, the rest, if you see a three in the second digit, that doesn't come with a lab. All right, and if you have a chance, take the robotic course. It's taught by Dr. Uh, Becker and it's super fun. Okay, and also cybersecurity, that's something also interesting and people want to get more exposure to say the computer science, you want to pick the data structure course and here, and bump some of the other electives in lower places because the uh, department has a limit on how many computer science courses students can take. And the embedded has a little bit higher priority because they actually can select one more computer science course here in this category. And I think if you have class, I'm definitely highly recommended. I personally have a I have a bachelor in electrical engineering and I have a master in electrical engineering and a master in computer science. At that time, for my PhD, it was electrical engineering, but I basically designed my own computer engineering curriculum because at that time, there was no such uh, degree called computer engineering and anything close to that. So I was both uh, fluent in programming and of course, it was the circuit design. So I highly recommend that you take a, one more computer course because your, your concentration is still called computer and embedded. People expect that you know the basics of the data structures. And then there's robotics, R, the robotic OS, ROS is a robotic OS is also very popular, but I think that's a high level course. You probably come back for the graduate school, there's an equivalent session for grads. I don't think you have enough class time for that, but do take one intro to robotics. And the last thing, okay, I have so many favorite things. Intro to machine learning. By all means, if you can take one machine learning course, do it. Now, it's so popular and it's uh, mostly done in Python and you can do basic machine learning in your embedded systems because see all the cameras gonna watch for some scenes. They're gonna detect the movement and stuff and they're all done as machine learning. So that's also a good course. So pick three here on this column, including things you already taken. Then select three more here and here of course if you don't want to take those select uh, courses from the right hand side column you can pick anywhere from the entire sheet so if you want to broaden your view to take some power courses you could as well all right so i know i always have more things to say <laughs> than the time allows that's my so-called quick intro to embedded system. I'm really excited about this because I personally think about all the computer boards or FPG boards as my toys. So I'm really passionate about this and be sure that you go into this concentration because you have passion in this, not just because this concentration gives you, earns, allow you to earn more money because every single day you have to do something you're really happy about. So passion is number one. Again, this is true for both choosing embedded or computer engineering. So I'll leave uh, time for some questions. Now, again, I think it lost the tab again. So maybe if I unshare, then I can see more tabs. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I guess with that, thank you yeah, Dr. Okay. for coming out. If we have any questions, feel free, guys. I think I covered most of the questions already posted. Uh, 
I guess if there's question about control, I say it's about state space control, and that's a upper level course. That's the second course of the control series. I think that's good. So both are good. Yeah, I just I just listed a bunch of um, controls courses. Yeah. There. Yeah, that's your course. Uh, your your mm -hmm. question. State space is this known as. Yeah, I just tried to answer. Oh, um, okay. State space for those interested is. Um, I took it when I was undergrad. It's it's known as typically controls too. So you'd probably first probably take like automatic or something. Yeah, um, the first one which is, is one of the courses. Right, right. I think you first for pick the one on the elective list. That's the one you want to take yeah. first, because I think you have to do the continuous ones before you can get the concept of discrete. Ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. And I think if you're going to take a controls course, I believe it's it's on multiple concentration electives, right. uh, especially even computer and embedded. The automatic controls um, is a really is a really good one. Oh, there's a question about how long will it take you to sign the form once <laughs> we email it? Well, the fast response time is two minutes. <laughs> but that that's pretty good. That's depending pretty good. on depending on time. Because if I'm in a meeting, then I have piles of things I had to go through at a certain time. But in case I'm just happen to write my own stuff on the computer and see, especially advising things, I'm gonna take a look first. So it's anyway again. Because each day I got all these requests and plus lots of spam, like academic spams that I don't look at. And uh, I try to mark whenever I see uh, a student advising request, but sometimes I can skip one. So basically, if I don't process that today and didn't see it in market, the next day I don't see that anymore because there will be hundreds of emails in my bottom of the, my mail list. And usually, definitely before 24 hours. So if you don't hear from me, the chance that I haven't seen it. And if I don't see that now or mark it, I will not see that again. So expect within 24 hours, depending on the day, even late night, maybe 11 p.m., I will respond in two minutes. Who knows? But if you don't hear from me uh, in two days or a little bit over one day, just email me again. And I just realized one student like uh, two days ago saying, yeah, I sent you one earlier. You didn't respond. And this is the form again. I look at the name of student. I say, I never seen this email from this student. And I search for the name. Of course, I find it. But I will never see or never know that student's waiting for my answer unless he approached me again. So that's <laughs> unfortunate thing is that there's no new uniform submission site for those. I would rather that the school has a submission request place so I can go there. That means nothing I miss, but it's mixed with my hundreds of emails every day. So response time for me is really quick. Okay. And if you don't hear from me uh, for a day, just email me again. Okay. I will not be offended. All right. Any other questions? So do you, uh, the next question is, uh, do you have any suggestions on certif certificates or practice training outside of school that will be helpful? Uh, I don't think necessary. I think because all our core class are very intense, that means you better spend your semester learning this the best, getting the best out of the classes, especially for my class. You really want to spend all your time that to get to the depth and knowing everything I taught. And the other thing is that we have a final project that's a place where you can shine. So it's not restricted by say just, oh, I only spend 10 hours. No, you spend definitely more than that per week because it's needed to get you really shine. And also paying attention to lectures, what I said is crucial. And one thing is the last pandemic, I told you that my student got hired and the student said, if he answered a bunch of technical questions and then he think he did well and at the end they asked this really hard question he said uh, he paused a little bit and thinking oh this is what dr chen said in his, in her first class so he answered that way and he got a job right away so it was really impressive because that was before the pandemic age that means you only hear my lecture once and he remembered what i exactly said during my first lecture that's how you land a job. And again, people and the throat smash are so said so many things that's in, important. There's another student who came to me a few years later saying, Dr. Chen, I got interviewed by Qualcomm. And they asked one question exactly the same way as you, you taught in the class, but I forgot the answer. <laughs> of course, he, he didn't get the, 
the job. So I think when you are at school, concentrate on what you can get, get the best out of the classes and don't just study for the exams. There's no use. So my, in, like in my classes, I, well, you need to memorize something, but my goal is training your thinking, something you never can, you can never forget. Because to me, it won't make sense to spend the whole semester effort, then you're gonna forget everything I taught in one week, right? So I basically train your thinking, something that you can carry you as a whole career. And it doesn't matter if you be doing hardware or software, but you have to spend your time on it. It's almost like uh, when you do a bouncy ball, the, the harder you actually throw the ball to the wall, the better it will bounce back. So for me, it's a wall that prepared to take your energy. So you, how many energy you put in is how many energy and sometimes even more to get out. So you have to be initiator to uh, get the best out of classes. And this is true for all classes. So I think if you get out of school or the summertime, if you want to take tons of other certification or sometimes just watching the free classes from EDX or Coursera, you could, but this should not be in the semester where you can basically get the best out of the professors, get the class while you <laughs> heavy ball. <laughs> That's a heavy ball. Yeah. That's really, yeah, I, I believe it's definitely worth it, but you really have to take the initiative. And then I treat everybody as engineers. I debug code for my students. That's why I have a course uh, like class limit. And every year I help, even for one lab, I help maybe 20 students personally. They'll email me the files. I look at them, I give them suggestions. Sometimes they fix the bug after a couple of rounds. But it's really, if you, you are staying away from even bring the question up, you will not do well, right? It's not something that you hide in a corner trying to figure out how to derive your math equations. So this is about how to apply the concept into practical code. You have to seek help when you actually cannot think clearly. And we have TAs, we have me, of course, but if you kind of hide behind your door, then we cannot get the best out of it. So that's what I my recommendation. Is. Again, it's definitely a heavy ball. You have to, you have to get prepared. <laughs> And so that's it. So again, uh, for me, uh, if you are interested in this, after I skip so many of you, uh, like several are still like it, uh, when you actually send me the request form and also make mention that you hear this, uh, my course or something in this advising week, and you think this is still the best fit, then I'll, I'll sign off. If you don't say that, I'll give you a second round of questions. Or sometimes I give my warning stickers for my permission form. It's pretty scary saying that you cannot skip labs and stuff. And on the other side, it's not a critical thing, but the students are expected to spend about $100 to purchase their own FPGA board like this. It's shipped from Taiwan. So you have to order, once you're admitted in the class, you have to order in time. The vendor create a common site for us to share the shipping. So if you order, say, before December 1st, they could ship one shipment to UH and people split out a shipping cost. So last year, people only paid $5 for shipping, but if you do yourself, the shipping fees probably plus the custom fees, probably 35 to $50 per person. So that's something you have to keep in uh, track. And again, it's a second round. You're not, if you sign a degree plan, you're not in the class. If you don't fill out the permission form when time comes, you're not in class at all. Okay, so that's your responsibility. Again, it's true for all the class I'm talking about. Completing the degree plan is just your plan. And no other professor even get your, your degree plan. So check, have a check mark for even 44, 37, won't guarantee a seat for you in that year. If you realize in the last minute and the class, oh, you're out, you have to wait for another year. So you have to take initiative to sign up for all the courses some are permission only some of the first thing first come you have to when the the enrollment opens you have to really get in the first minute so it's your responsibility to take which course is taught in which semester and uh, where you should sign for it and by the way the the advanced micro p is also only taught in spring so if you miss one, you have to wait for a whole year that's true for all the core courses i think pretty much for the rest of the electives but i don't know exactly what which semester they are taught so you you are welcome to approach those professors asking them which semester they can ta teach for that course and again the students once you get to the junior year i guess some of the listeners will be 
rising senior, I would say you're approaching this a little bit late because uh, usually we plan this for two years, but it's possible to squeeze in one year, but you, everybody has to take your own initiative because we treat you as an engineer and you have to treat yourself as an engineer as well to be able to take care of everything. Nothing is automatic. Even for degree plan, I heard people upload the, the form to a team without my signature thinking, I will sign over there. No, I'm not even a team member. So some student told me about that. So everything you have to approach professors, you have to approach Ms. Amanda, and you have to initiate everything you want, and you'll get the best results you have. Okay, we will respond back to you. And in case I don't respond within 12, 24 hours, just approach me again because I didn't see it. All right, so we have the reputation that I respond to every single student request. All right, <laughs> it's long. I don't know how to shorten my talk. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you very much for coming out. Um, I know I'm going to have to get out of here pretty soon. So yeah, um, so you, have, you have class to run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have class in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you all for your patience. And again, I hope that uh, even if you don't take my class, you can approach me for advising or anything. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Chen, for coming out. Um, thank you, students, for attending Student Advisor Week. This is the last day, so it is the last topic. Um, so thank you very much for coming out. If you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you can reach me on LinkedIn, Discord, email, whatever. Um, and so thank you guys for coming, and I hope you guys learned a lot this week. Okay. Right. Let's talk to you. Bye. You guys have a great day. I'll see y'all later.